welcome to this closing session on day two um, of Ahmedabad Learning Dialogues, which is a very differently positioned conference, conversation um, that celebrates the idea of active learning and interdisciplinarity. And one that connects humanities and social sciences and sciences with the professions, engineering, management, medicine, public health, etc. And within that, you know, a classroom is really at the heart or the center of learning. And consequently, any educational reform must understand its influence, its current challenges, and the opportunity that the new thinking around the classroom holds for both faculty and, and students. Um, I've of, often wondered what does academic leadership mean in this context and what outcomes should we expect from a classroom? Um, and where does the classroom connect with the lessons of life, citizenship, and the love for lifelong learning? To make us understand these and other related issues um, much better, we have three very deep thinkers who have a vision for education and who also believe in actioning them. All three have reconceptualized educational experience, experimented with how learning can take place within a university and have defined educational systems that would keep the student at the center of any inquiry and compassion, both as a learner, as well as an originator of ideas. All three, as Juhi mentioned, have built highly impactful institutions. Geeta Narayanan, my former compatriot from the other end of Bangalore, is the founder director of India's most socially engaged Shrishti School of Design, Art, Design and Technology. Patrick Awa is the founder and president of Ashesi University in Ghana. A highly influential and impactful liberal academic institution in Africa. And Richard Miller, who was the founding president of Olin College of Engineering in the US, an institution um, that I must say, which has played a very important role in helping us think very differently at Ahmedabad. They've been very innovative and very deliberate about how they grow young leaders in their respective institution. Thank you very much, Geeta, Patrick, and Rick for taking time on a Sunday to be with us. Let me, um, um, you know, we over the last two days have um, had many um, speakers come and talk about their own experiences in shaping education in some in, in Indian institutions very differently. Um, we've also had some breakout sessions whereby there have been hands-on kind of courses that have been um, doing. But let me start by asking each one of you, um, you know, what was it about our existing learning environment that got each one of you to move from your highly successful positions in which you were as academics, as in the case of Rick and, and Gita, or industry leadership, as in the case of Patrick, to take on the task of building new institutions? Were there some concerns that you really wanted to, to address? Geeta, maybe Geeta, Rick, Patrick, I mean, whichever way sequence, you know. Thank you so much, Pankaj. Um, I hope my voice is clear, Juhi, and I, I can be yes. heard. Yes. Um, you know, I've been thinking about that question. And I think that my own concerns about, you know, I had a choice to make, Pankaj. As you said, I had a choice that I could be an academic. I could be, you know, get my PhD, 
produce papers sit in the Western world because the offers were really uh, in Western academia, or I could return and work in, in our own country where things were very, very different. And when you ask, when you ask me this question, it goes back to my own personal history. In, um, in early, in the in mid 1960s, 66 tells you how old I am now. Uh, and so we give that game away right away. Uh, I had just finished my schooling here in Bangalore and I won a scholarship for a year to go and do a year abroad uh, in a US university. And as luck would have it, I went to Kent State University, which was at the height of the anti-Vietnam war. It was an extremely liberal place. And they ran a lab school called the Kent State University High School. And interacting between the university and the university lab school, I began to understand how education itself was changing. I wasn't interested in education. I, I mean, I just finished senior Cambridge with a classic mathematics, physics, um, uh, kind of background. And that exposure, I realized, stayed with me through my years of college in India, because I came back to study and finish my uh, mathematics honors degree here in Bangalore. And the contrast was chalk and cheese, right? I hear I was being given notes by my professors. There was no, uh, none, no involvement in them. And I had just come from being part of a highly experimental one-year program at Kent State University where interdisciplinarity, um, different forms of instruction were being talked about for the very first time. And at, when I finished my college, uh, my father was very keen that I go to, back to the US and that I pick up operations research and join the flow of Indians at that point. And I think that's when I made the first critical decision. The first decision was just to stay in India and teach. Of course, later I went back again and did my PhD and master's abroad. But to walk the floor, to walk, make the road by walking, as Paolo Freire says, is a very difficult job. It's very much easier to put things around and propose it from the safe walls of academia. And I really uh, have to thank my children, my family, everybody for the support for these very, very difficult years when you start with no nothing because there's no money, there's no philanthropy. So what drove me? Krishna Kumar's work drove me because his work, you know, was really about how Indian systems were inert forever. And if Just, somebody- uh, to, to mention to others, Krishna Kumar is one of the very leading academics of school education and in India. And basically he was talking about how there's a recursive kind of pattern of inertia in inertness in the system. And, and that drew me into complexity theory. And so I started by really thinking that I would walk the floor. I would start with nothing and begin a new institution, but I would also use the learnings of complexity theory, which came from my doctoral work and understanding of, uh, how we can actually think about think about education ecologically, how we can think about it as a system of moving and interacting parts, how uh, a linear um, sequential way of putting learning was not so advantageous as a recursive model, which spiraled around and you came back. Uh, arg arguments for resilience and many other things came out of these dialogues. I also was very fortunate that people joined me on this journey uh, at Shrishti, uh, you know, who are still part of Shrishti today, but whose passion for good education has never dried up. And that, that's my story. Thank you. Rick, you've been an academic, you were an academic for very long periods of time. That's right. Um, so Olin is a very unusual startup. Um, it was not my idea to start the school it was the F.W. Olin Foundation uh, who had this idea because there was a great deal of unhappiness in America about the way engineers are prepared. Uh, it turns out that about 5% of undergraduate students study engineering in the United States, and yet a very high fraction of the country's gross domestic product is the result of technology entrepreneurship, which depends on engineers, and we weren't doing very good at getting uh, students interested in it. In fact, uh, it's pretty clear in the US that without the infusion of talent from India, for example, and other parts of the world in engineering, the US would not be competitive. 
Uh, and the way engineers were prepared um, is well documented in the 90s as being inadequate. Uh, the National Science Foundation in the US um, uh, created a program called the Engineering Education Coalitions Program. They spent over $100 million trying to persuade universities to change. And I think uh, this was very unsuccessful. So the Owen Foundation decided the only way was to start over entirely um, and that they would have to create an entirely independent institution from the ground up. And, to, and, and when society has an issue that doesn't change for a generation or more, it's usually because the basic assumptions are wrong and no one is prepared to challenge those basic assumptions. And so if you start from a blank sheet and guarantee that you will not have any sacred cows, as they say, um, you, we, so Olin has no tenure, for example, we have no academic departments. Everything at Olin in principle has an expiration date, including the curriculum. Um, and as a result of this, uh, we have to think differently. So I was happy in my role as Dean of Engineering at the University of Iowa at the time, and I got this letter that said, you should stop that and come and join us. Why would I do this? Well, as I read their report, I, I had this tug on my heart. Um, what, was, what really counted um, in terms of the prestige of the University of Iowa was our PhD program and how many people were members of the national academies and so forth. Uh, undergraduates were sort of those little people who run around that you have to deal with uh, in order to get there. This was just wrong. And I think the turning point for me was the fact that I had two young daughters at the time, one of them who was about six when I started at Iowa, and she was interested in music. So we put her in the Suzuki school for music. You know, they have these lessons around the world. I don't know what you know about Suzuki, but they, it's, a, it's an experiential learning program. So even if you're six, you can play the violin, but you have to learn to listen. Um, and, I, and they have a unique program that requires parents to sit with the students for all the lessons. So you're a partner with the child. I learned how to teach from watching the Suzuki teachers teach. Um, just this one little vignette, I think explains it all. So this young lady who's six um, goes to these lessons and they have a, a really tiny violin um, and the teacher never criticizes what they did for the first 10 minutes. They always has two or three very positive things to say, no matter how it sounds. Oh, I can see you've been working on the way you hold your hand. It looks a lot better this week than it did last week. Oh, and I really like the way you're holding your bow, okay? And then finally, they get to this instruction part, which says, oh, you know how the song goes in the middle uh, where it goes like this? look, let's play this together. I think we can do it even better. So at the end of the lesson, my daughter didn't even know she was being corrected. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very enthusiastic about coming next week. Now, the next day, I sit in a class in statics and strength of materials in the engineering program for first year students. None of this encouragement shows up. It's all very strict. Um, and as a result, the kids say, it's like looking to your left and looking to your right. One of you won't be here at the end of the semester. This is like joining the Marine Corps. We call it the math science death march. Um, so we could do better. And I eventually decided, okay, this is something worthy of the rest of my career. I'm going to resign from Iowa. I'm going to start over. And that's how I got into this. Oh, what, a, what a wonderful... Um, uh, set of story there. Patrick, yours, what, what got you to start a new university? Well, for me, it was just the uh, realization when my son was born, when my first child was born, I was living in Seattle, working at Microsoft. And, you know, this child is born and suddenly I'm focused on the next generation. Not just on this child, but just a realization that, you know, there's another generation coming and future generations coming um, and, and feeling that, you know, what happens in Africa is going to be important for all people of African descent. So even if I raised my kid in America, um, what happened in Africa would matter to them. And that's really what got me to start looking back at what can I do to make a positive contribution uh, back in Africa and back in Ghana specifically where I was from. 
And, you know, so I started to ask this question and I was talking with lots of friends and family in Ghana. And a couple of things that really struck me was one was that we would take different problems, um, just any problem, and just ask a simple question, why? And when you do that, you get a set of answers and you would take each of those answers and ask why again, you get another set and you sort of drill down. But it seemed that it didn't matter what problem we would start with. We would end up with leadership as a very significant reason why this problem still exists in the country. Mm. Um, leadership as defined by all the people in charge, people in positions of responsibility, people who can make a difference, who were one, either just accepting the status quo or two, were themselves sometimes the cause of the problem, right? Uh, corruption and so on. So that was one. The second um, was that I had a, I actually had an aha moment conversations with my father and my, and my, and a cousin of mine, my brother, actually my adopted brother. And my father had asked me about what I studied in engineering in the United States. And I took, you know, we went through the curriculum that I'd gone through and he made a really curious remark. You know, he said, wow, it doesn't look like you studied much engineering. <laughs> and then he followed it up with, you know, I've worked with a few engineers who were also educated in the U.S., and they're all like you. They don't seem to have studied much engineering. But every time I've worked on a pro project with them, they seem to have come up with solutions faster than anybody else. And they came up with the most creative solutions. And he was really very puzzled by this phenomenon. He just didn't understand, you know, why is, why is this happening? Um, and then my brother, you know, one of these exercises where we're talking about problems, we're talking about something that was in the media. And he said, it's so interesting, those of you who go to the U.S., when you come back, the kinds of problems you grapple with are things that we just accept. So like I, he, he had stayed in Ghana and he just accepted the status quo. I think these two conversations uh, made a big impression on me because it got me to really look at what was different about the education that, that I, had, I had experienced at Swarthmore and what was the status quo in Ghana. And then when you do that, the differences are very stark. It's very didactic here. It's a lot of road learning. It's a lot of road memory, memorization. It's a professor or teacher telling you what the right answer is. And then at the end of the semester, asking you, what did I tell you the right answer was? Um, <laughs> versus, you know, a, a model where it's all about analysis and critical reasoning. And, and actually the idea that there's multiple solutions in the solution space and there's multiple right answers to problems and so on. And so this is what got me to think, look, if I came back to Ghana and set up a model that did things differently and demonstrated to people here that if you, if you educate people differently, you're going to get different results. You're going to be solving problems of a different nature um, than if you're just educating them in this didactic road way. So that was really what got me to think that I could, I should. Uh, so it was, my, it was my son making me feel like I should be back doing something here um, and then these other conversations that led me to believe that we needed to just change how education is done, focus on critical reasoning and problem solving, um, multidisciplinary learning, um, a strong focus on ethics, right? Um, and, you know, asking students to have those deep conversations about what society they would like to see and what role they should play in actually creating that society. I think you, you, um, your last statement really led, leads me into already defining what might be the design principles that you might have used for purposes of setting up. Um, Gita, what about you? What, what may have been the design principles that you used at Shrishti? And, and I'll ask Rick the same uh, question. Um, 
Well, the design principle I uh, I used, um, and actually I do have one, Pankaj, uh, which is which is a very concrete one. As I as I said before, I had started looking at complexity, right? And complexity is about systems thinking, and uh, systems thinking is about uh, parts and holes and how the, how the parts and holes start interacting with each other. I was also at that time uh, reading the work of people like Christopher Alexander in the uh, in the U.S., where he's written about what gives the principles of order from nature that gives something life. So the assumption I was making, as you know, is of the staticity, how education was static, it was inert. And there was Christopher Alexander giving you the principles that would give something life. And complexity tells you everything's a system. And so what I, I started doing was uh, merging the two together. So I started thinking about centers. What, where, do, you know, if you can imagine a rectangle, not a circle, right? Center of a circle is very easy. You see everything equal. But if you were thinking of something which was a shape like a rectangle and you had to put a dot somewhere in that rectangle, which would be a pivot, where would you put it? You could put it almost anywhere in that white space. But the minute you put it, you change that space. It's not a blank space anymore. So then that's how I started building Shishti. I started building it with these dots of interconnected and interrelated centers. They may not be called centers. They may have been called by various names, but they you can't have one center and then say that you're an institution. You have to have multiple centers that actually start talking to each other and interrelate with each other. And very much like Richard said, we never had departments. We never had people belonging to a silo anywhere. Uh, we did have, in fact, we had the same principle. You said it had a shelf life of, you know, uh, with an expiration date. Uh, my students used to say, well, everything has to die before something uh, grow. So this constant need to feed change uh, through these interconnecting things was, was the first design principle that, that I used. But the two other principles were uh, perhaps more philosophical. You know, the principle of wholeness, not holistic as in H-O-L-I-S-T, but W-H-O-L-E, wholeness, is about centers and interrelating parts. It is about how you actually choose what is going to be your pivot. You can put a dot somewhere, but you have to actually choose what that dot is going to be and what, what it is. So are you going to ground your educational philosophy in practice? Are you going to ground it in, um, in fostering a certain kind of awareness such as uh, environmental or sustainability becomes, when you say we are interested in social impact, it didn't just happen. What was that center? And how did we make it whole? How did we get the system of interrelated parts? The second one was influenced by, again, a lot of thinkers who I won't go into now, was the idea of slowness, right? Everybody is wants something fast, you know? We were just talking the other day, everybody wants this, you know, coming from that MBA world that you are, Pankaj. Everybody wants that executive summary, one page, uh, can you put it across, make your pitch in five minutes or whatever it is? And I began to look at it and I'll, I'll tell this as a vignette or a story, which I often do because it makes more sense. Whenever I talk about slowness, people think it just means more time. They say, we don't have time, but no, it's a philosophy. So let's look at food today, right? And I'll use an Indian example of the idli, which will maybe resonate with our audience and maybe new to Rick and uh, to you, Patrick, but Today, uh, you can make a call and somebody will come with a little plastic bag on a bicycle and give you an idli for 10 bucks. Right? Uh, but if you want to make more of an effort to make idli and you're on your way home from work, you can pick up the batter at a grocery store and go make it yourself. Or you can buy a ready mix that you get out of a packet and you do it. And uh, then you can make it yourself which means you have to get the rice and you have to dal and you have to soak it and you have to grind it and you have to make all the accompaniments to go. So whether you take a pizza as an example or an idli, when you make a pizza, the dough needs 24 hours to get prepared and you need the sauces and the accompaniments. So when you think of education as not fast, as something that 
And this, I bring that point today because it worries me that we're getting faster and faster. Where it worries me that we don't engage deeply enough. We don't provide in our curriculum time for introspection, for reflection, where wisdom is gained, for conversation. Right? And, the, and the last design thinking principle I've used, coming from Christopher Alexander again, is don't waste your time with the current virus or meme of the month. Forget about it. Think about what has lasted centuries. He asks you to question what is timeless and what is enduring. To communicate is timeless. You might communicate today through our, as we are doing through a digital medium, but we're still communicating. Having a conversation is timeless. So when you bring the idea of enduring understandings or enduring values, something that has, is, can, you can change the camera to a cell phone but you're still sharing that image. That is, these are the three things, wholeness, the notion of systems, slowness, and the fact that something must be timeless. If you put that together, yes, it is a recipe of some kind to change the thinking on how you should construct an institution. Sure. Rick, did you have something very different when you started to first think about the university, what was the shape of the classroom? What did classroom mean to you? And what was the design principle you had in mind? Well, I honestly didn't know much about how to do this. I, I never took a course on how to start an institution. <laughs> uh, so I had partners and friends and I, I, there are several problems that were pretty clear and I need, knew needed to be addressed at the beginning, but the main idea was to invite others to help invent the place. So for example, uh, we began with a set of core values. Um, one of the things that I'm convinced even more so today than I was 20 years ago is probably the most important thing that's missing in technical education is character and ethics. Um, understanding that the levers of science and engineering are so powerful now that the unintended consequences can overwhelm society. And we take responsibility for the welfare of society as we grab the, the uh, steering wheel for this technical enterprise. Um, so we need to start at the beginning. And the first thing was a set of five uh, core values before anybody even joined us to make sure we were all on the same page. Um, another thing that uh, became clear to me as I reflected back on the years before Olin, uh, why is it that so few uh, students persist in the study of engineering um, at least in the US. And the, the overwhelming conclusion was that they're just not engaged. As Patrick so eloquently explained, the teachers stand in front and they read from the book and they tell you to fill out the multiple choice test and they ask you why you didn't get the right answer uh, as if there were a right answer to most things. Um, and this just is not engaging. So um, it became clear to me that not everything that's important in life you learn from a book. Probably the most important things come from inside you. They come from your heart. Um, this is where music comes from. Uh, it comes from a song in your heart. This is where art comes from of all kinds. This is where truth comes from. This is where judgment comes from. This is where ethics comes from. The other things can be learned. Uh, this has to be grown with experience. So we look for ways to engage students from the beginning in which they have to express themselves. They have to stand in front of others. They have to, um, uh, you know, this is not new. Anyone who has a PhD knows that this is what happens at the end of your PhD is you stand in front of a, a jury and you talk for, in some cases, several hours about what you're doing and answer questions. And it's not about giving them the right answer or memorizing the, it's about how you deal with the complexities of reflection on the reality of life. Um, when we, we had a very first meeting, and I think uh, this explains a lot about the uh, invention at Olin, we had about 10 faculty at the time. They're not all engineers because it takes more than engineers to make an engineer. Um, we sat around the room and we said, what do you remember about your undergraduate education? There was largely silence. Most people couldn't remember anything except the project they did. And then a hand went up. Uh, a young chemist in the, in the group said, I have a question. Uh, can you tell me what an engineer is? 
Um, don't we need to know what an engineer is before we can design the curriculum? Um, and by the way, uh, what does every engineer need to know? Because we have to write this down. You know, in the 25 years I've been in engineering uh, education before that, never had this question ever come up in an engineering department meeting. Um, and it was the most profound question that we had to deal with. We had, and it took us months to deal with this because it was a real question. And we eventually concluded, on uh, my words now, an engineer is a person who envisions what has never been and does whatever it takes to make it happen to make a better world. It doesn't begin with math. It begins with vision. Mm -hmm. And it has a purpose. And the purpose is always to make a better world. We are not creating tools that will fit perfectly into the industrial enterprise. It's exactly what Microsoft wants as their first employee or what Boeing wants or what Tesla wants. We're creating opportunities for our, our children. We want them to be able to do anything um, moving forward. So, so this set the stage and then um, as Gita did so well, uh, talk about the principles of design thinking, we wound up uh, adopting a lot of the philosophies uh, that the D School at Stanford uses in um, design thinking. So there, there's a snapshot of the initial days at Olin. Patrick, did you, did you construct, get the, uh, in a similar way, construct the classrooms differently? Did you have conversations and what did a classroom mean for a seshi and, and what, were, uh, uh, what were the object that you may have wanted to achieve in that classroom? Because at the end of the day, there's also a structure. And, and right. there is also a regulator, <laughs> and there's also <laughs> curriculum. I mean, all of that now are colliding with each other in quite some ways to create this magic that all three of you did. That's that's absolutely right, and I think a lot of the things that we were thinking about um, have already been spoken about. But I just want to touch on just the idea that you know when you start from a uh, from a point of view that you don't want didactic teaching. You don't want the classroom to be about the teacher. You want it to be about the students, right? There's many layers to that. There's obviously the curriculum, but there's also who do you hire to be the teacher to begin with? So one of the things that we did, one of the most important things in any classrooms is what, who is the teacher and how do they, how do they engage with students? Mm. And so we actually had a, a requirement in our hiring of faculty that they would send to us a statement of their teaching philosophy in addition to their scholarly interest. And that um, when we, had, we finally came up with a, 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 you know, the short list, we would have them actually teach a class before we made the hiring decision. And sometimes the, the class was a class of high school kids, <laughs> right? So, and sometimes it was students at a chassis and our faculty and board members and so on, but we wanted to see them in the classroom. Now, we, we think that if you wanna have a very strong student-centered learning environment, the physical structure of the classroom also matters, right? So you want, you want an instructor to be somebody who is sort of like a guide to the students, right? Um, so they're guiding the student in the process of inquiry and discovery. And we want the students to learn from each other as much as they learn from the instructor, right? Um, and so for us, physically, our classrooms, um, you know, when we, when we first built our campus, all the classrooms except for the laboratories were sort of in a U-shaped format. So the seats, the students could all see each other. There was an instructor in front, but there was the, the rest of the class was in a U-shape and it was all graded so that the instructor had eye contact with every student. Students have eye, had eye contact with each other. And a lot of the, a lot of the classrooms and courses were structured, structured as discussions, right? So that was just physically doing something that was going to be almost like a forcing function uh, to enable conversation between the students and, and, and the faculty. And then the other thing that we did 
uh, was that we we actually feel that the classroom goes beyond the physical infrastructure on campus um, to having students going out and doing community service in the community, for example, or going and doing internships, finding projects to do for companies. So the whole world really is a classroom, if you think about it that way. And so being intentional about getting our students off campus, being, a, being an institution without walls, right, without borders, we want, we want to have, not have borders within the institution and not have borders between our institution and, and, and community and society. And so being intentional about structuring the curriculum in such a way that it would get students out there doing work and engaging with people outside the university community was part of quote, our classroom. And Gita, I mean, Shristi um, uh, has such a strong element of design training. So there's so much of doing orientation. Mm -hmm. did, did you, I mean, I, I mean you, of course you had to build in the skills part of it at one end, um, but you also got kids out to do things on Bangalore uh, metro stations and, and outside. How was this outside and the inside and the, and the doing connected? Because that's very special about Shrishti. I think it is based on one kind of, we have one pedagogical principle that we have been using for a very long time. Mm. Uh, and that can, be, that can be put in either place as text or the city as the text. Uh, that you don't, you, you know, sitting inside, uh, like Patrick said, uh, inside the in a four walls of an institution doesn't really give you that exposure. But if you're sitting in a metro station and you're talking about migration, which is what they did, they were running a unit on reimagining migration, then you're watching not this big migration that you may talk about, which is political and thing, but you're walk, looking at local migration about people moving inside the city. Uh, from City Market and Lalbagh and uh, City Market into, say, Cumberland Park or wherever it is, they experience the city. I, I want to build on that to say that it's not enough just to have place as text or city as text. It's not enough just to throw your kids out there um, with, with um, uh, because it can become like a scavenger hunt, you know. They, they go around and they give questionnaires and they give... Uh, uh, get, get all their data and they come back. It's about the experience. I think that the making of a classroom really has uh, three very important aspects as precursors to what happens in the classroom. Uh, the first one is history, Pankaj, um, because everything and everybody has a history. And you need, one needs to look at that, that history as experience as what other people have called first person consciousness. Every student who's sitting in front of us comes with a consciousness that comes between an interaction between themselves and their environment. It could be a gendered history, it, should be, it could be a cultural history, it could be a social history, it could even be a cognitive history. I mean, it, there, there is a history there. So when you're designing your classroom, one has to realize that there is that issue. The second issue is this notion of emotion, right? Uh, one of the things we destroy sadly in our country, even today, and I know all of you uh, would agree with me, is students feel hopeless. They don't feel that life is out there. You know, when Patrick said, I have a son and I have a future, I felt like that Patrick when I had my first grandchild, right? suddenly my horizon is two generations, right? But when I meet my young students in Shrishti, they have already had 12 years of schooling before them, which has told them that if you've got the cutoff point, where's your private tuition? Will you get into this institution? How much are you costing me? Uh, how much is this going to be? What will be the placement? So already emotionally, they come uh, unable to let go unable to let learning happen uh, in an intuitive, uh, osmotic kind of way. And we have to keep that in mind. Uh, and the third point is that we're talking about cognition here. And cognition we know today is embodied. It is in the, as much in, in your biology 
uh, as it is in just the brain cells, right? So it's a, it's a mixture of your experience. It's a mixture of your emotion. And so you can have the best teacher. You can have the most exciting activity. You can be in the most uh, wonderfully uh, opportunistic place, but it's all for nothing if we don't actually craft a pedagogy that allows you to search for what is not there. You know, you, you raise a, a very interesting question in my mind because, um, you know, that students come with very different experiences. They are also very different kind of learners. Yes. But here is a curriculum which is, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to that issue in the classroom. It's very, it's, it's structured. Um, every, it's structured not in a, in, a, in a sense that everybody has to do the same thing, but once you get into the classroom, you know, there is a design which some, all of them have to do in some fashion. How do you craft it differently? Well, Shishti, the way we craft it is first, uh, uh, the first thing is to generate a sense of safety. You know, you have to have the opening of the list, the thing, whatever your curriculum may be, whoever you teach, if you can't get your students into feeling safe in wherever the space is, it can be a metro station or it can be your backyard, it can be a classroom, it can be a shack, right? But the students have to be able to talk. There can't be a culture of silence in the classroom. They, they should be able to say, I don't know. Can, can you explain that again? I haven't got it because we all suffer from this. I'm tossing a ball at you, the teacher, and they catch it, you know. Uh, instruction is like throwing a ball, but it's not. It's about generating conversations. And I go back to that thing of needing that time for introspection, for having a break and saying, okay, we've got somewhere. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's, let's put up your work. Let's think a little more about where we are in this. It's not about relentlessly walking through an activity. And I think that experience, diversity, and the fact that these students want to be able to be learned. Uh, people like Gardner have, type, have a typology that they are, uh, in, in, they are visual learners or they are uh, kinesthetic learners. I don't subscribe to that so much. I subscribe to the feeling that as long as your environment is safe, uh, most students aspire to be a practitioner. I've changed in Shishti the word from the word student. Everybody now refers to our students as aspiring practitioners. And, and Pankaj, as that one change, has suddenly made them almost equals. Okay. Rick, what, what's been your experience on that count of, of, of taking very diverse set of students um, and, and bringing them into the... I know, Patrick, yours must be very diverse too in that yeah. sense. Rick? So um, I think what defines uh, our uh, current position in this journey of understanding what learning is about is experimentation. Um, we began to uh, ask the question, as I mentioned before, what is an engineer? And what does every engineer need to know? And we realized that engineers are not the same thing as um, scientists or mathematicians, that engineers have to start with people find out what their needs are, uh, propose various possible solutions, and then invent things uh, without having an answer before you start. So you have to make something and react to it. This is very much like uh, design in an art studio. Although I'm not an artist, I know that when you have studio-based learning, there's a sculpture that sits there for weeks as it takes shape and people walk by it every day and they say, oh, I think you're making a horse. And you say, no, actually it's a person. And then, you say, whoa, I can see why you think it's a horse. Uh, and then there's this evolution that happens. Um, it changes who you are if you make something as opposed to think that it's all an intellectual exercise mm. where you come up with the right answer. So we had all kinds of questions uh, that resulted in something we call the Olin Partner Year um, in which we had 15 boys and 15 girls who lived in a parking lot for a year while the campus was being constructed, um, not as students, they didn't take any credits that would help them graduate. They were partners in helping us uh, learn about how learning happens. 
So the first question that we had is, do you have to have two years of calculus and physics before you can pick up a wrench and make something? Because all of us had that experience when we were undergraduates. I was at the University of California as an undergraduate and I thought engineers made things. That's, what I, that's why I signed up. I mean, I grew up on a farm. I never met an engineer until I showed up at the university, but I kept having to wait. You know, not this year, go take physics and not next year and I had to take biology and chemistry Finding the third year, no, nope, not, not this year. We have to learn engineering science now, which is taking those things and applying them to thermodynamics and stuff. Finally, in the senior year, we, we, get, we pick this thing up. So we had a question, why do we do that? Um, there must be a reason. Um, maybe, you know, there's uh, Zeus, this Greek God up there that holds a lightning bolt in his hand and he'll strike you dead if you pick up a wrench before you get a B in physics. I mean, I, we don't know. Um, so we just tried it. The first experiment we had, we had a group of kids, uh, these again, 18 year olds, never been to college before, and we gave them an impossible test. We said, we have five weeks, we would like you to design, build and demonstrate a pulse oximeter. Now you probably know what that is today because of COVID. This is that thing they clip on your finger and it measures the oxygen content in your blood. You can buy them now like a thermometer. Um, so they have, but they were 18, they've never had any physics. We said, um, start with a patent lit literature, uh, which the inventor has to have a little diagram and uh, like a two pages describes what it does. Uh, yeah, it has things called transistors in it. Don't worry about that. This is a lot of physics in there. Um, there's some tools over on the side, um, go make one. We want you to design and build one and demonstrate it and do it in five weeks. And no, this is not an intelligence test. So we don't care if you talk to your neighbor. In fact, if you have an aunt or an uncle that works in a hospital, ask them, maybe they can help. But you only have five weeks. And we figured for sure this would fail. And we would learn a lot from seeing what happens when you try to do something without the prerequisites. But we were shocked. In five weeks, they built one and it was actually working. In fact, we brought in a hospital version and set it right next to each other. And you could see they were doing the same thing. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. You wouldn't want to buy this thing that the kids made. It was kind of a miracle because the solder was all over the place and it shouldn't have worked, but it did. Um, and we learned two things from this. In fact, we learned a lot of things because we repeated that for the whole year, that kind of thing, because we thought it must have been an accident. Uh, no, Zeus will not strike you dead if you try to make things without having the physics course first. Um, in fact, almost everything that you touch today that works as an engineering miracle was built with that process. Not with first getting a B in a class that taught you all about it, but just trying it and see if it works. And then we realized the kids taught us what the Wright brothers knew, uh, that these two bicycle mechanics in Ohio who kept jumping off a cliff with these wings on their back invented the aircraft industry. They did not have a theory of aeronautics at the time and they weren't working at a physics lab. Uh, they were just trying things. So maybe there's something to this, teaching the process of invention, the process of experimentation and making things. The other thing we learned was way more important and it took a while for us to figure it out. And that is the way this process impacted the students themselves. It was as if they were two feet taller now after they had been through this. There was this huge, yes, I can change the world. If I have a, like a handful of classmates and a couple of old guys ask questions once in a while, I can change the world. Um, and we reflected back on the way we felt in the first year of our undergraduate engineering education. I guarantee you, none of us felt like we could change the world. Um, we were intimidated. We felt this was way over our heads. We were bored. We didn't understand why we were learning this stuff. And many people dropped out. Uh, so that is the starting point for what the classroom should look like. It's about real people. In fact, I'll just tell you one other short thing. We've now taken this design thinking to people. We have a course in which all students on the first day are put in a small team and they ask a simple question. Identify a group of people whose lives you want to change. Not someday, but in the next four months. Let's find a 10 of them and let's go interview them for a couple of hours. And then you're going to invent different ways to improve their lives and design and develop this and bring it back to them before the end of the semester. That process builds empathy and a sense of belonging and identity with the people. 
the fact that there is no class that tells you how to make the thing that you invented builds agency, uh, since that I, it's not about taking a course, it's about taking the initiative. Uh, and finally, when you return and you show them what you've made and you see the joy in their eyes, it builds a sense of purpose. I can make a difference in the world. And you build on that. And Olin does that kind of thing for eight consecutive semesters. So that's basically what our classroom looks like. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely amazing. Patrick, you must be having diverse set of students come from very different environments. How do you make that their learning so specific to themselves? Or what's been your general methodology? Well, you know, that, that's, a, that's an interesting and difficult question, right? Because I think there's, a, there's this notion that we're preparing people to go out into the real world. They're going to enter into companies. And um, regardless of who you are and your history and your particular strengths or weaknesses, you need to enter a team and be productive on that team right. and be useful on that team, right? And so th the way we sort of deal with this is we actually have students do a lot of projects in teams. And so, and, and so you know, th they're going to be with a group of people who are differently scaled, who come from different economic backgrounds, who've had who've gone to come from different high schools, et cetera, et cetera. And they need to fi find a way to work with each other. And I, I should say that, you know, um, you know, when I first met, when I first met Rick um, and, you know, many people had, had asked me to go see Olin. And so I did. And I was so struck by, this experiment that they had done with students built doing engineering projects before they had studied, you know, college physics and, um, and differential equations and all of those things that I came back and, and suggested that we do the same. Right. And so in fact, we do the same with our engineering students, you know, the first semester they build something. Um, but, but for the campus as a whole, the first semester, they do a, um, a design course, a design thinking course, um, which culminates in coming up with um, business ideas, right? And every student goes through this. And one of, the first, um, one of the first tasks that they have in this course is to identify a problem that they would like to solve or a problem that is worth solving. And one of the first festivals we have on campus is what we call the Problem Festival. It is a festival where students only present problems that they have identified. So they're not jumping into solutions yet. They are just looking at their envir environment and identifying problems, questions that they'd like to answer, fully formulating and understanding those problems and presenting and explaining those problems to each other and to all the rest of us. Um, and if you, you think about it, knowing that there's a problem or understanding a problem is actually the first step in coming up with a solution. And they do this together as in teams, right? Um, from different backgrounds. Um, and so I do think that, that the experiential part of learning is a very powerful way to meet people where they are and have them learn to work with each other. Um, there's also, um, you know, uh, Jita talked about how people need to feel safe and you need to have a safe environment for people to speak up and to discover and to say, I don't know, um, which is very true. But we also need to teach people not to be fragile, right? So even if you're in a place that doesn't feel so safe, you feel like you don't belong because you're in a team with people from a different background than you. Um, we need to 
we need to help you develop grit. And actually, um, many of these students, most of these students, even to have made it to college, to have made it to a place like a chassis, must have had a tremendous amount of grit before they got there. And you just need to remind them of that. <laughs> you just need to remind people that you've been through some really incredible experiences and you've persevered and you've got to where you are and you, you need to keep doing that to move forward. So th this is how we kind of, um, but it is, as it is a complex question. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, struck by what you, a sentence that you said, you know, which is really a, a challenge that I know many faculty consciously or subconsciously face and don't address it. How do you meet people where they are? Yes. I think that's right. a very important point that you've made because, and, and I, I mean, here we have faculty who are trained at some of the, in, 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 in as deep a way as they are at, at great places, um, walk into a classroom, but they don't, they have to meet the student from what they carry at that point of time. Um, I, I think I can go on, but I must take a, several questions and there've been host of them piling up here. Um, and can, can I just say, I wanted to please. comment a little bit on what uh, uh, Richard and uh, Patrick have said. I think there are two very, two very big points that they have made and I share them, but I just want to state them out aloud for the, or for the sake of the audience and for the fact that I appreciate it. Uh, the making of the oximeter, for example. Uh, you know, one gets frightened to put people for faculty. And as you say, they're very well-trained faculty. They're coming from uh, very, very, uh, uh, well, August backgrounds, Ivy League backgrounds, whatever you may call it, but they, do, they feel that they would be letting the students down if they didn't tell them how to do it before you allowed them to do it. So it's not necessarily calculus or physics, but it's also in the mechanics of saying, well, let them make it and then let them, as Patrick said, identify the problem. And Patrick, I want to comment on your point about grit. I think grit is very important. And, and grit goes to the thing of emotional resilience, right? And that, yeah. that's what I talked about. I think we do have to build in our students emotional resilience to be able to fail and to say, it's okay, fail, fail again, but you'll get somewhere by failing. You may not always get somewhere by getting everything right in the first shot. So I just wanted to, to just add that to what both of you have said. Thanks. Thanks, Gita, for, for underlining those. There's a very interesting question that um, Sheetal Bhandari mentioned. She says, um, what special arrangements, attributes or practices that one uh, needs to think about for putting, building ethics and in enhancing student participation? Any thoughts from any one of you? Yeah. Yeah, let me take a stab at this because the only course that I've taught in the last decade is a course called Issues in Leadership and Ethics. Um, this is a course that um, I started by calling the presidents of the two neighboring universities around us, Babson College and Wellesley College, and inviting their presidents to team teach this with me. It's not that I have like a PhD in philosophy and ethics, but um, we could we can convene guest speakers who have been involved in high profile ethics challenges and bring them to the class to tell their story. And then the students can, can um, interrogate them. Um, I think this may be the most important thing I did at Olin. Uh, I learned more about this than the students did. One of the things that I learned um, is that ethics um, is about doing, you know, not what you can do, but what you should do. And when you begin to parse that, it's not just, it's more complex. What you should do has two branches on that tree. One is what you should do as an individual. And the other one is what you should do as a society. And the methodologies for getting the answers to those two questions are quite different. The methodology to getting the answer to what society to do, should do is always about public discourse 
Uh, it's about uh, conversations across diverse populations. It involves things like um, Kantianism, utilitarianism, and philosophy. But what you should do as an individual is very different. What you should do as an individual is built up from your own personal experience and it comes from your heart. Um, in fact, there's neuroscience now that shows that when you're put into an ethical dilemma, the part of your brain that's involved in deciding what's the right thing to do doesn't even involve the prefrontal cortex. It's deeper than that. It has to do with the mirror neurons inside which uh, little babies yeah, demonstrate when they make eye contact with their mother for the first time without being taught to do this. It's about our human need to be a part of a community. Um, so, th so that ethics is fundamentally a tension between self-interest on the one hand and societal responsibility on the other hand. Um, and you have to navigate that. And it's often dealt with through experience. It's, you know, Aristotle's approach is really quite useful where you have to develop um, habits of doing the right thing when the stakes are low um, before you are prepared to deal with it when the stakes are high. And by the way, because you want to talk about utilitarianism on Tuesday at 10 a.m. because it's on the schedule, does not mean the students have any interest in hearing about it. Um, <laughs> Ethics is about teachable moments in children's lives. I agree, I agree. So well said. Patrick, you were wanting to say something about it too. Yeah, I was saying that, I was going to say that we do a, a bunch of stuff. I mean, so there is, first of all, having a code of conduct at the university that we enforce, right? I mean, that's where we started. Um, uh, but it's also in the curriculum, we don't have a course called ethics, but we have four seminars called leadership. And those leadership seminars are all, you know, getting to issues around ethics. There's one that is about what a leader does is at sort of at the personal level. There's one that has to do with leadership at the macro level. Like Rick said, there's a personal and then there's a societal. Um, there's, a, there's a seminar that has to do with going out and, and, and working in community and so on. But the first seminar, which is a, talks about the personal level, has a, has a module in it called Giving Voice to Values. And it's something that we picked up uh, from a professor in the U.S. called Mary Gentili, who had done some really interesting work. But if I had to summarize, I would say that a Giving Voice of Values uh, seminar has to do with this notion that people need to practice uh, behavior that aligns with, with their values, Right. And so they go through, a, they, they do role playing on a number of cases that present ethical dilemmas. And some of these cases we bring from the alumni. So we have alumni come and present real situations that they have confronted out in the real world. Um, uh, we have students also tell us situations they've encountered on campus and they role play what the right um, responses are to, to it. Um, they also write papers where they sort of describe times when um, a situation has been in conflict with their values. And they have to point out a time when they succeeded in sort of living up to their values and, and a time when they failed <laughs> to do so and describe why. But it's sort of this sort of self-reflection that goes on but there's also this, the, the effect of simulation. It's the same way you know, a, a pilot learns to deal with a real situation, the flight simulator. Okay. Because they've practiced this before, when they eventually meet it in the real world, they're more likely to have the right response. So, so it's, a, it's a broad set of things that we do. Um, and then finally, I think one of the most important things we did on our campus was we went to the students and said, you know, we've got this code of conduct and we, we enforce it, right? But we don't think it's right that we're the ones who are policing this code of conduct. We think you should own it. You should own the culture of integrity on our campus because the reality is 
it will be what what you sign up to. So we can police all we want, but if you don't if you don't buy into it, then we're not really achieving anything. And this challenge to the students got them to set off on a, they did a series of debates on campus and conversations that lasted a year and a half. And it culminated in them deciding to enact an honor system on campus where they would pledge, it started as, a, as an honor system around exams, that they would pledge to not cheat um, and to not tolerate those who did. <laughs> And this is how the honor system started. And, and they said, you, you don't need to proctor our exams anymore. You don't need to invigilate exams at this institution. We will do it ourselves. And we said, okay. And, and the day we, we, uh, we sort of ratified the honor system, you know, the board and everybody else agreed. I said to the students, we've now given you a tremendous power. You have the power to make your alma mater great but you also have the power to destroy it. <laughs> it's all in your hands now, right? And, and they've taken this responsibility very seriously, right? So, and I think that that moment was a very important moment on, on our campus because now the, the mission and the culture around integrity and all of that, this, the students feel that they own it. And the seminars that they go through and all of that are just ways to sort of, sort of strengthen their ability to execute this mission that they have taken ownership for. So, so, so well crafted. In yeah, it. I think in the art and design world, Pankaj, uh, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Richard and Patrick have said, so I'm not going to add what Shishti does because that would just, you know, it's late in the day. But I think that one of the points to, to keep in mind when one talks about ethics in our country and design is the relationship between the informal sector of artisanals, uh, artisans and the design schools, uh, you know, and the appropriation. Is it really ethical for design students to uh, visit uh, indigenous uh, communities uh, who are makers of their own, uh, appropriate their ideas, bring them back, and turn them into business ideas that go to market and the owner of that idea doesn't get anything at all. So the discussions in ethics in a art and design school are really uh, all of the above as have been discussed about proctoring and trust and 24 hour campuses and can we leave you alone in that campus or must we have somebody to uh, think equipment and so on. But it's also about the ethics of appropriation. Mm -hmm. and, and that has been, been one of the most uh, difficult conversations because they have to happen in situ in the right place at the right time. You can't have a course on it. So it's got to be embedded almost like DNA into everything. So well, so well. My colleague Raghu Rangarajan wants to know from Patrick, how big are your classes for the first year students when they try to solve these problems and create a business plan and are well, um, the classes, uh, as classes at Ashesi range from 10 students in a class to 70 students in a class, sometimes 80, even 80 students in a class. And with the freshman class, the design class, design thinking class, I, the important thing is they start with small teams, right? So you have small teams of students working together. Um, by the end of the semester, uh, some of the ideas will be selected to continue on to the second semester as, you know, micro businesses on campus. And those are bigger teams. Those, I think, will grow to maybe 10 students or, or even more. Um, so they're working with larger teams and, ha and having to co uh, navigate and coordinate around that. But the design class is, is one of the larger classes. I think it's 40, 50 students in a class. Um, when they're meeting with the faculty uh, who are teaching them. Um, then when they're doing the project, it's smaller teams. Sure. Um, Arjun Sanyal has an interesting question, a little bit um, keeping the context um, around the world in mind. He says, 
how do new classroom learning experiences ensure that diversity of learners is recognized and championed? Given the way debate in both Indian and, and US politics is getting so polarized, how do classroom encourage openness versus conflict? This is a much broader question around the classroom, but it is indeed a, a challenge that we are facing in, 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 in India for sure, where everybody seems to um, have to self-censure. And the yeah. classroom can't be a place where you can self-censure. And online suddenly becomes a very dangerous place <laughs> because everything is, gets recorded and, and, and there's this, this anxiety around. Right, I so I'll, I'll take a cut of that. Um, this is a very uh, sort of topical and pressing issue on I think any university campus now. Um, and it is absolutely the case that in a learning environment, you need to have penalty free conversations. You need to have a way to have these penalty-free conversations. Um, it is also the case that you need to have an environment that is inclusive. And one of the things that, and we sort of, we, we sort of talk about both of these things on our campus, but we have an office of, that, is, that is dedicated to diversity and inclusion. And one of the functions of that office is that they do some coaching and training campus-wide for faculty, for administration, for the students on, 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 in this area, right? And that helps us navigate, you know, the kinds of conversations that, that we, can have, we can have on campus. Now, um, you know, I'll, I'll share an example of uh, a student. This was, this was very early on in Ashesi's history, I think in our third year or so, we had a student who had come from a sort of very sort of patriarchal, male-dominated community. And, you know, in one of the conversations in class, you know, a woman had disagreed with him on some top, something that he said, and his response was, how, how dare you disagree with me? I'm a man. <laughs> now, this, this, this is the kind of statement, right? That, I mean, this is not the reason why somebody's right or wrong is not your gender, right? Um, that you need to correct that student, mm -hmm. right? So the faculty member needs to correct that that is not a valid argument other students in the classroom need to correct this student and they need to have a proper conversation about the idea that is being discussed, right? And he needs to be corrected. So we can all agree on that. The second thing that needs to happen is that it should not be held against him for the rest of his sort of stay on campus. The correction has been done. He has seen a different way of, of you know, making arguments. We get on with it, um, which, which is what happened in his case. You know, he, he graduated. He was actually voted as a class speaker for his class by fellow students when they were graduating. He's a terrific guy, right? And when that happens, then you can feel as, a, as an institution that you've done your job, right? Somebody got set straight on, and I gave that example because a particularly egregious example, uh, statement that he made, but our job is to educate future leaders for our country. And we want that um, these leaders are going to be good leaders. And so if you've done that job and they're going to go off and be good leaders, you should be happy about it. And they should not then become a victim of, you know, I think that, that you know, the, the phrase that's used now, especially in the U S is canceling people and this sort of thing. And that's what I mean by penalty free conversations. You need to have a, a place where people can make a mistake. They will be corrected 
but that mistake will not hang around their necks for, for, the, for the entirety of their time on campus. Um, and I think that the work that our diversity and inclusion office does is very helpful um, uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this area. Rick? I couldn't agree more. I think Patrick did a spectacular job of outlining the, the complexity. I mean, the human race has a history of tribalism. Each of us grew up in a community that had its own sort of unspoken culture and set of values, which are not tested until you spend time in a different community that has a different set of cultural values and you, have, and you discover these. If we're going to create a society in which people get along, and if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that the, we will not survive as a species unless we learn that all of us are brothers and sisters, that we all have the same fate. We have to teach our young people that uh, learning to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries, across time zones, and across political boundaries is essential. This should be a fundamental general education requirement for all of us. They need to feel that they belong. So we need to find a way to have these difficult conversations when someone needs to be corrected for having a, a view which is not conducive to collaboration across these areas um, in a way which works. Now, here's the thing that I'm seeing that's worrying me is that too many of these conversations about uh, correcting people start out with a narrative that is um, um, judgmental, is condescending, and is self-righteous. Um, and if we start there, my worry is that you will not change people's hearts. Uh, they will have defenses to this. Um, it's not about my idea was wrong, it's that I am wrong. Um, and that just creates resistance. That doesn't create understanding. Um, I don't think that we, certainly in the US, we're not very skilled at this. As you can see, I think um, I would, argue that you should not follow what the U.S. is doing. Uh, we're heading in exactly the wrong direction in so many ways. But uh, we as educators, I think, have a special responsibility to model these conversations as Patrick is doing so well um, to correct people. I, so I'm going to give an example. I think that both Patrick and Richard have given uh, very powerful examples of how it can. I'll add one. A uh, particular one to India, because this is largely the audience here is at home. Uh, for me, the challenge in, in leadership and in running institutions came uh, at early last year when the uh, CAA uh, blew up in our face. And uh, CAA was just for, for everyone, yeah. I mean, was an uh, 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 act that the current government brought in place to put a registry for citizenship. And, and it, um, it was also seen as excluding yeah. large number of people um, in India. So it polarized, you know, I mean, that's the argument, right? Here we have a case in point where there is something that's being enacted as law and your student population in front of you gets polarized and, and, and they want to talk about it. And uh, what we actually did, I think, was a case where I thought we handled it very well. And I, I'm giving it as an example. Uh, we decided that we would give uh, two days in the week, you know, when students would not have their regular classes or Wednesdays and Fridays, for example. And we got all, all people involved. You know, we had uh, from the National Law School, we had people come in and talk about the act and talk about what, what, what it was without, without polemics, without taking any uh, political or adversarial positions. We had filmmakers come and screen. We had uh, NGOs and activists come and talk what it means to uh, marginal groups and other kinds of things and what it was. And at every point, the discussion was different because, and it was an open session. So you could come or you need not come. There was no penalty, as you said, for not turning up. You know, uh, you, you could turn up if you wanted, but you were really given attendance and, and in your class. What also, of course, we can't stop people from expressing their opinions on putting it out there. And we, we, we let it be. We didn't, we didn't gate it. We didn't stop it. 
but you have the other side as well inside your institution. You don't have only one lobby. You have multiple lobbies. And the, I, uh, the difficult thing from the office of the director is how do you allow the multiple lobbies to share ideas and talk in a safe space where they can ask questions and then come back to the classroom the next day and sit by side by side with each other and talk about graphic design or talk about business services or something like that. Um, I think uh, Shai Heredia, who was the curator and filmmaker who organized the talks, uh, got, uh, did it. We started doing it for four weeks. We also had healers, we had therapists, uh, we had counselors come in, but they talked about these problems, about anxiety, about difference, about what it meant. I think that I thought I was going to do it for two weeks and maybe four or eight sessions. We actually went on for six weeks. And at the end of six weeks, we, I had a group of people, young boys who came into my office and he said, thank you. Uh, we, we represent a different point of view, but we feel very safe here that we can have a different point of view and we're not going to be ostracized for it. It takes a lot of work and it can't happen in the main classroom while lessons are going on. And sometimes I think that this is the classroom. What a, what a nice way to end uh, uh, Gita, this session and what is uh, what is the classroom and how to make it impactful. You know, there are many um, uh, fabulous uh, ideas and, and experiences that that came out underlying the fact that our role is also very different. Yes. You know, we're not a prison. <laughs> yes. Our role is to be able to to, uh, to take people who are very diverse in every sense and be able to create an environment where they grow, they learn, um, they learn through their mistakes, they learn, but at the end of the day, they go out from our institutions being better people than what they came in, in every sense of the word. I know I've, uh, we are already about seven minutes past our ending time. I don't want to take um, uh, more time from all of you who've been very kind enough to be with us on this Sunday, um, as well as the audience, you know, uh, there are already 169 people who are staying here, which is uh, which shows how engaging all of you have been. So thank you very much, Rick, for for being here. Thank you, Patrick, for taking time. Pleasure. And I get to see you and and engage with you. Um, and thank you very much, Geeta. Thank you for, for your worldview. And thank you everyone who joined us in this conversation and hopefully we'll, we'll continue this in our institutions in our own interesting way as we go along. Yeah. Thank you very Bye -bye. much.